Da. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Can you all can you all hear me? Okay. Great. Um, thank you all so much for coming, and thank you, Julie, for that. Wherever she went, uh, for that. Oh, there you're right here. Perfect. <laughs> you're right. Perfect. Excellent. Now you're a friendly face that we can focus on. Um, uh, for, for being here, um, and thanks so much for that beautiful introduction. Thank you all for being here. I want to echo what Julie said about this amazing program, this amazing series, this amazing space, and you're so happy to have us here. I am so thrilled to be here and so excited to, I finally have you all to myself. Yeah, it's no, like, they, they're so not here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. I read, I read and loved her book and, and so excited to talk with you. So the way it'll work um, is that we're both going to read briefly 10 minutes uh, or so, um, and then we're going to have a very informal conversation. We have not planned anything. Mm -hmm. um, um, and we haven't time. finished each other's books right. for reasons we'll explain. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. Uh, for very, yeah, very specific reasons. Very specific yeah. reasons. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so we're going to have a very sort of informal conversation. But Rebecca, you're going to read first? Yes, okay. that's the plan. Excellent. So, All right. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here. This is my first time in Provincetown. So, oh. like. <laughs> what, and, like, what? <laughs> The like, best place on earth. Best place on earth, and also like, clearly, but also like to be here, like here doing this in this barn, like the day before we launch mm -hmm. this historic Pride Month, mm -hmm. like, and then also, did you guys know it's Walt Whitman's two hundredth birthday? <laughs> he, I don't think he hung out in Provincetown, but still, like that's I'm still okay. Um, okay, um, so because of all that. I'm going to read a section that I've never read before, also because I'm really sick of the sections I always read. Um, but I have a Pride Parade section in this mm -hmm. book, and it's kind of late. There are a couple spoilers, but I'll be careful about some of them. Um, the great thing about reading something in public that I've never read in public before is I have no idea what I need to fill you in on beforehand. So I'm going to be interrupting myself constantly to give you information <laughs> that you need. Um, but the main thing here is, um, it is the summer of 1986. We are in Chicago. It's um, my main character is a guy named Yale Tishman. He's in his early 30s. Um, he is um, his world is both falling apart and taking on greater meaning in the midst of this epidemic as it circles closer and closer to him. Um, and um, this is the one spoiler: um, is the fact that this guy named Charlie is his ex by this point in the book. Um, he's um, not into Charlie's hypocrisy regarding safe sex that's going on. Charlie's going to be in the parade. Um, and the other people you'll meet are simply friends of his. And then um, Harold Washington, who's mentioned toward the end, as I might, as I would hope you know, um, first black mayor of Chicago and I believe of any major American city. We just got our second last week. <laughs> so, um, and Harold Washington, um, uh, according to many was gay, according to others was not, but was definitely an ally until his untimely death in office. So, all right. By the time he got to Clark, the route was packed and the first few floats had gone by. He wound his way behind people, looking for someone he recognized. At Wellington, he looked for Ross and his friends and their fire escape, but not too hard. After two blocks, he spotted Katsu Tatami across the street. And when a few people ran across behind the Anheuser-Busch float, he crossed too. He didn't know the guys Katsu was standing with, but Katsu was always good for a hug, an enthusiastic greeting. He had to shout in Yale's ear, so far so good, you want my soda? He thrust a McDonald's cup at Yale, and a thought about germs flashed across Yale's mind, but he willfully ignored it. He took a sip and then wished he hadn't, warm, flat sugar water. A bunch of Harleys rolled past, followed by a lesbian dojo, women kicking and chopping their way down the street, dressed in white. Miss Gay Wisconsin, earnest middle-aged women with P-flag signs, a huge brass bed pulled by a convertible, and occupied by two men making out with tremendous gusto, their torsos bare above a thin white sheet. Um, this, all my research on this was YouTube related. It was awesome. Um, okay. <laughs> Yale asked Katsu how he was, and Katsu said, I'm becoming a legal expert. He explained, shouted, that he'd gotten new insurance two years ago. In January, he was feeling terrible and finally got tested, and he had it. Did Yale know? Yeah, son of a bitch. He hadn't even told his mom, and his goddamn insurance was trying to claim that the virus was a pre-existing condition so they wouldn't have to cover it. 
even though I got the insurance before the fucking test came out, but they're claiming I should have known because three years ago I was treated for thrush one time, and that's enough for them to turn me down. He needed pentamidine treatments, and he'd need hospital care that wasn't at fucking county, where he'd been a couple of times, and was Yale aware what it smelled like in there? There was a reason it was free. So Asher, this is their lawyer friend, was helping him apply for the social security he had to get before he could get Medicaid, because apparently that was how things worked in this stupid country. And do you know what I have to prove? Okay, this is insane. We have to prove I'm disabled, which I am now because I could work maybe four days a week, but the fifth day I get the run so bad I'm glued to the bathroom floor. This was tenable for his part-time gig at Howard Brown, but not for the administrative assistant work that used to pay the bills and supply the useless insurance. But the runs aren't a disability category, you know? So Asher's finding me this junior litigator, and here's what he has to prove at this hearing. He has to show that I can't do any unskilled sedentary labor in the national economy, like the entire nation, and the fucking examples they use. You wanna hear the examples? Yale was exhausted just listening to Katsu, but sure, he wanted to hear. A drag queen passed on stilts in an elaborate Statue of Liberty costume, all green sparkles and gauze. I shit you not, nut sorter. That's not a euphemism, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. Bowling ball polisher, also not a euphemism. Silverware wrapper, like sitting there wrapping silverware in napkins. Everyone's, everyone wants their spoons handled by a guy with the AIDS, one, AIDS runs, right? Wafer topper, I don't even know what that means. The last one for real is fish hook spec inspector in Alaska. <laughs> they don't care that I can't get to Alaska and could never get this job. They care that it's a job in the national economy. So yeah, my survival now depends on proving I can't top wafers. <laughs> Here came a bunch of guys in leather, a poster that read, bound up with pride. Some kind of garden club followed. But I'm gonna get in on whatever clinical trials I can. And Asher's helping, Yell said. Yeah, Asher, he can sort my nuts whenever he wants, am I right? <laughs> Yale felt his face catch fire. Yale has a huge crush on Asher. <laughs> oh, come on, you'd let him polish your bowling balls. <laughs> Yale attempted a noncommittal laugh. And here, ridiculously, before he could properly recover, was Asher's AFC float. Here was Asher waving like a politician. Yale waved, but he didn't catch Asher's eye. Three guys on unicycles came next, cutoffs and denim vests a series of aldermen and state senators in convertibles, most looking pained. The Out Loud float, and this is the gay weekly newspaper that is Yale's ex's paper. A red flatbed truck. Yale took a small step back so Katsu couldn't see his face, so he didn't have to worry what his eyes and mouth were doing. Poster board signs all over it. Fight out loud for safer sex, and out loud says, cover your head. Six beautiful shirtless men, Yale didn't recognize them except for Dwight, the copy editor, angling cucumbers from their crotches, slowly rolling rubbers onto them, peeling them off, doing it again, opening new packets with their teeth, milking the crowd for cheers. From the side of the truck, Gloria and Raphael threw rubbers from a bucket. He couldn't see Charlie, and then suddenly he could. He had shaved his beard. He was the one holding the boom box that blasted, you spin me round. Yale tried to wrap his mind around the irony of the whole thing, but his body was busy reacting with some strange combination of high and low blood pressure. A Trojan hit Katsu on the chest and he caught it, laughing, and handed it to Yale. He said, I'm a lifestyles man, you want? And although Yale could not see an occasion in which he'd want to use a rubber that had come indirectly from Charlie, he stuck it in the pocket of his shorts. He'd need to get used to them. Until he'd redone the test in March, until Dr. Cheng had told them again that the ELISA was negative. Though this time he really had made Yale wait two weeks as he'd vowed. Yale had barely let himself ejaculate in the same room as Roman, the young guy he's seeing. Lately, since the second negative, this is where it's like, we're gonna be on the radio, and um, are we, can I say stuff and you can bleep it out later? Or can we just go for it? We're just, we're just gonna go for it, okay. Lately, since the second negative, he'd been letting Roman suck him off. Though what did lately really mean when it was all so sporadic? Yale wished the out loud float would disappear, but it was still making its slow way down Clark, Trojans still flying. 
Someone scratched him between the shoulder blades and he turned to see Teddy grinning, bouncing. Look who came out of hiding, Teddy said. Teddy is a friend who um, is a philosophy PhD candidate. Yale should have known that Teddy might have been part of Katsu's group, and honestly, it was good to see him. Good, especially, that Teddy was talking as if he didn't think Yale was a monster for breaking up with Charlie. Yale told them about the clan activity in the park. He said, they're gone now. They didn't actually want to see any of this, you know? They left before the parade started. Katsu said, I bet half are secretly sticking around. Bet they're jacking off under their robes. <laughs> Only one guy had a robe, actually. I found that weirdly disappointing. They had, like, combat gear and those weird little shields. Yell said, what do they want besides attention? Um, according to their giant banner, they want to quarantine the queers. Real original. Anyway, we yelled back for a long time, and these dykes made out right in front of them. And then they just packed up. I stuck around to talk to a reporter. Anyone want a hot dog? I'm starving. There was no point trying to move till the parade was over. And when it finally was, they followed the crowd to the park for the rally. Katsu took off, and Yale found himself alone with Teddy in an endless line for food. Yale said, I hope we're still friends. I was mad at you, Teddy said, but it was just temporary. I was judging you for being judgmental. Ironic, right? I'm not sure I was being judgmental. I know that for you, the news was Charlie testing positive, but for me, the news was him cheating on me. Maybe everyone else already knew, but I didn't. And things hadn't been great between us for a long time. The line lurched, and Yale made sure the guys behind them were strangers. He said, I feel like we're all caught up in some huge cycle of judgment. We spend our whole lives unlearning it, and here we are. The thing is, Teddy said, the disease itself feels like a judgment. We've all got a little Jesse Helms on our shoulder, right? If you got it from sleeping with a thousand guys, then it's a judgment on your promiscuity. If you got it from sleeping with one guy once, that's almost worse. It's like a judgment on all of us. Like the act itself is the problem and not the number of times you did it. And if you got it because you thought you couldn't, it's a judgment on your hubris. And if you got it because you knew you could and you didn't care, it's a judgment on how much you hate yourself. Isn't that why the world loves Ryan White so much? How could God have it out for some poor kid with a blood disorder? But then people are still being terrible. They're judging him just for being sick, not even for the way he got it. Yale tended to find Teddy mentally draining, but he was right this time. Way over at the bandstand, Mayor Washington had begun to speak. As a black man who has suffered discrimination, he was saying, as part of a race of people who have suffered. And Teddy said, he's a good one, yeah, we lucked out. So I'm going to read one more section. I always want to say, though, um, as in my acknowledgments, those are Harold Washington's words. That's my one act of plagiarism here, mm -hmm. but it's acknowledged in the mm -hmm. book. Um, so every other chapter, and they're much shorter chapters, it's a much thinner thread that's woven through the novel, um, is the younger sister of one of Yale's friends who has died. And it's, um, we knew her in the 80s and her 20s. It's 2015. It's 30 years later. She's in her 50s. And she's in Paris. Don't worry about why. Um, <laughs> and um, she's staying with a friend um, who has some photo albums from back in the day. She wasn't ready to look at them before, but she is now. And the one thing you need to know here is that in her adult life, she works. Um, uh, her job is that she manages a resale shop that benefits AIDS housing. If anyone knows Chicago, it's loosely based, loosely based on the brown elephant in Chicago. There were 20 albums on the shelf, a fact Fiona hadn't absorbed that first day. Rows of black leather, brown leather, colored canvas. When she pulled a thick red album off the shelf, though, a paper slipped out and landed on the floor. Fiona attempted to clutch the album closed before anything else fell, but she dropped the whole thing, and now there were papers everywhere. Cream-colored sheets folded in half, small cards, a lavender page with a grainy photo of a man. They were funeral bulletins and prayer cards. She got on her knees and started stacking them. This wasn't a photo album at all, she saw, when she opened it to an old clipping from Out Loud Chicago, an obituary of someone who danced with the Alvin Ailey Theater. Jesus. She opened the album at the beginning and tried to slide the papers back into the empty spots. A man named Oscar, no one she remembered, had died in 1984. A clipping about Katsu Tatami from 1986. Here was the bulletin for Terrence Robinson, Nico's Terrence, Jonathan Bird, Dwight Sumner. There were so impossibly many. In her current life, it happened at least once a week that someone would wander into the store and then, 
when they discovered its mission, say something like, oh, I remember that time. Fiona had learned to check her temper, to push her toes into the floor so her face didn't change. I knew someone whose cousin had it, they'd continue. Did you ever see Philadelphia? And they'd shake their heads in dismay. And how could she answer? They meant well, all of them. How could she explain that this city was a graveyard? That they were walking every day through streets where there had been a holocaust, a mass murder of neglect and antipathy? That when they stepped through a pocket of cold air, didn't they understand it was a ghost? It was a boy the world had spat out. Here in her hand, a stack of ghosts. Mm. I will stop there. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> um, um, I'll go off from that. I was making notes because I want to ask you about insurance and oh, logistics yeah. and all that you had to research <laughs> mm. for all of that. And, and to say also that if you're going to have a conversation about insurance and all of that, where, where better to intersperse it than a pride parade, right? With, I mean, with, with all, this, all this going on, that was just a masterfully, like, masterfully done just in terms of reader attention. I right, thought, like, yeah, like, right. like Statue of Liberty and Stilts helps the, like, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> right, right, right. I, have a writing, I, I had a writing teacher who said once, like, somebody asked him, can I, can I write a scene in which there are two people on a train um, discussing Kierkegaard in a, in a novel? And he said, you could absolutely do that. He's like, just make sure the reader knows that there's a bomb under the seat. Right? And so was, this, like, was that Jay Perini? <laughs> yes, Jay Perini. Oh my God, you I know, know him. You know that? This, he no, tells those same stories. He right? totally does, again. but yeah. I had him as a yes, writing instructor at right? He told and me the same story. Such good advice. That's amazing. And you kind of did that, right? Except the bomb was the parade. So you've got, anyway, sorry. We're going to have a little bit of a writing workshop. Yes. Because uh, we, we can't help it. We're, we both teach writing a lot, so we can't help thinking about that. Um, so I'm just going to read... Um, from the beginning of this novel, um, which um, I shouldn't have to set up because I'm reading from the beginning, um, but I will anyway. Um, no, just, just to say that it's narrated by uh, Frank Merlo, who was the partner of Tennessee Williams, uh, for, who someone people here may have heard of, um, um, for about 15 years um, between, 19, between the late 40s and the early 60s. Um, and, um, and it's set in the, um, this is set in the early, early 50s, um, and they're in Italy. Which again, you'd all know from hearing this, but I've just said it anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so this is from chapter one, and it's called The Little Horse, uh, which is the nickname that Williams had for, uh, for Frank. Truman was throwing a party in Portofino, and Frank wanted to go. The invitation came in mid-July, slipped between parentheses and the long gossipy paragraphs of his letter to Ten, as if daring him to acknowledge it. Frank read the letter in Ten's absence. He'd been stuck for weeks in their stuffy fourth floor apartment on Via Firenze, waiting for him to get back from Spain while on the loud streets below the real Romans escaped for the mountains. He replied to Truman with a brief telegram. And then he called the finest hotel in town, the Splendido, to book a room. He auditioned various linen jackets and swim trunks and hats in the mirror above the dresser, mended two pairs of Ten socks, and walked their silks down to the cleaners. When Ten returned home to find their bags lined up in the hall, packed for another trip, he didn't protest. He was sweet on Frank again, after three weeks apart. A drive in the Jag up the coast of Liguria far from the melting heart of the Centro, could only make things sweeter. They took one last walk through the Villa Borghese. They followed two boys, the dark one, Tens, the blonde for Frank, down the Spanish steps and out the eastern side to the Corso, pulled along by the smoothness of their elbows. Not a hint of saggy skin on Tens' boy, his long arms tanned by lazy days on the beach at Ostia, or on Frank's, a Swiss. Who could say where the Swiss got that scar, new and pink across the knob of the elbow, or where he spent his own empty afternoons? Who could say he was a Swiss at all and not from dis some disappointing place like Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> they, they could say, Frank and Ten, walking at a safe distance behind the boys as they liked so very much to do evenings after dinner 
those summers they lived in Rome, inventing lives for the Italians, inventing lives for themselves. It's what Ten was famous for. It was one of the many happy ways they passed their time together. They brought back the dark one, Mario, to Via Firenze, a Sicilian like Frank, it turned out, but at least he wasn't American. As he hastily slipped on, his es slipped on his espadrilles, color rising in his cheeks, Frank said to him, you've just slept with one of the world's greatest writers. And because Mario had heard of Tennessee Williams, he stayed for the coffee and pastries Frank brought onto the terrace. Soon, Mario grew tiresome, as they all did, talking of his mother, who expected him home, who worried there was always a mother. And they, and they watched with relief as he and his tight elbows descended the stairs. His, he, wasn't, he wasn't the first Mario, of course. Over the years, they forgot their names, but not their scars or their attitudes or the stories they told as they lay between them late into the night. Sometimes on their evening walks, the streets sultry and flickering with shadows. They'd spot one of the Marios in a piazza with his pack of friends, laughing, his arm slung over a girl's shoulder. If the Mario noticed them, he'd turn his face away or shoot back a look of defiance and shame and fear, which enlarged them. They left Rome the next morning. Truman had rented an apartment a few steps from the harbor above the Delfino restaurant, which Frank and Ten passed on their way up the hill to the Splendido. Ten paid the boat guy to carry their luggage, and when the hill got too steep, Frank grabbed the heavy case with the, with the typewriter. He didn't like it when another guy did work for him that he could do himself, a guy who would have been him if he'd never left Jersey. The Splendido was first a monastero, the boat guy told him, and now, look at it, que spettacolo, the place Clark Gable drinks his brandy to a view. Ten went straight to the desk as usual, and Frank arranged their stress shirts on hangers and brought their shoes down for shining and stole another hour for a nap. He'd never felt so tired in the middle of the afternoon, and he chalked it up to being 30. But it's, <laughs> but it's, but it's possible no, no doctor was ever, but it's possible no doctor was ever able to tell him for sure, one way or the other, that the trouble had already started in his lungs. When he woke, Ten offered him a pill. Ten had as many pills as Italy had houses on the water. But Frank wasn't taking pills, not then. Instead, he smoked another cigarette and paid the boat guy to drive him over the mountain to Paraji Beach, where he swam to find his strength and clear his head. They didn't like Truman much, but Frank didn't hate him the way Ten did, or maybe Ten didn't hate Truman. It was hard to know for sure with Ten. It was a job in itself keeping track of who he was angry with and who was jealous of him, whose parties he was looking forward to, and whose they'd have to make up some excuse to get out of. Frank's official job was as Ten's secretary, but even his secretary didn't have a reason for being in Portofino other than to stop by Truman's party, and he didn't know when they'd be leaving. There, was, there, there wasn't much Frank knew in the summer of, 50, of 1953, least of all how long he and Ten might last. At the Delfino, Frank lost track of him the first minute. Ten couldn't walk into a room without someone sweeping him up and into a crowd. How many times had Frank stood at the edge of the crowd as if on a shore, watching him drift for farther and farther out, his head bobbing on the waves, glancing back just once to meet his eyes? How many times had Frank found himself in an overflowing room like this one, greeting guests as they arrived, recognizing their faces from movies and the backstages of theaters. How many times had these people walked in, looked around, saw Frank, saw nobody, spotted a somebody over his shoulder, and then headed upstairs? A brass band started up. Frank danced with a French girl whose uncle watched from the bar. Girls liked to dance with Frank, and he with them. He had a way with a spin and a twirl and a catch and a bow, and this French girl she could follow. That wasn't always the case with girls, even the fancy brought up girls, but dancing with the clomping ones, even that was better than dancing with a guy, which he and Ten never did anyway. Sorry, which he and Ten never did anyway, not, not with each other at least, not even in Provincetown. He saw the world like that a lot then, what he did with Ten, what he had done with girls. In those years, there was no such thing as early, late, or on time. They went from place to place on a magic carpet, dropped here, dropped there, 
women in electric dresses, men in monkey suits and bow ties made of white silk, cognac, cigars, wine, the sky turquoise, even when it was gray. Because Ten had no mind and little use for schedules and logistics and coordinates, he needed Frank to organize the day they woke to and the coming days and even the days before. The life of Tennessee Williams was a, was a memory play in which memory was a jumble. It was bodies he remembered, bodies they remembered together, his body and Frank's, the southern gentleman and the little horse, the bodies of all the Marios from Key West to Marrakesh. When it came to matters of the body, Frank and Ten trusted each other like soldiers. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to interrogate each other. I know, now. right? Now, now, now it's coming. All right, excellent. <laughs> so yeah. we, we should probably start by explaining why we haven't finished each other's books. Right, that's a good one. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to go so first? That, yeah. I mean, this is good because it means that we'll be really good at not giving spoilers. Right, right. We to literally you guys. can't give spoilers. We can't we because, don't yeah. Have the so for me, I, I was, I've been like saving this book, and the, the, you know, like this thing happens when you, when writing is your career of, you have to schedule your writing almost like when you were a student of, you know, I'm doing this event, I have to read this, I have to blurb this, I have, you know. And so, you know, been been so excited for this book, and I was like, okay, I'm going to read it this week. And I was so set, I checked into my hotel, I'm going to finish the last 50 pages, it's great. And I check my email, and I have this thing from one of the places I teach that's like, today is the last day to do your Title IX online video training. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay. So I've been camped out in this gorgeous bed and breakfast on the bed. You chose like, com- Title IX over my bed. I, could, I chose said? not getting fired or <laughs> reprimanded right, by that's the fair. Yeah, That's totally yeah. fair. So totally I'm, fair. I was really <laughs> bummed out, but tomorrow I get to... <laughs> that's great. I and or that. the next day. Yeah. <laughs> and Rebecca's book, which of course I, like everyone else, has heard about and been dying to read. I, I had been listening to it um, on... on um, an, an, an audiobook. I, I I was listening it to it to it on Audible, and then I switched to Libro. You talk about you talk about Libro. No. Oh my God! It's like the oh, best is this, thing oh, ever. This is the uh, the yes. indie bookstore. Yes. Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. This is yes. what everyone should be doing. Yes. So if you're... anyone listens to audiobooks, I highly recommend you switch to Libro versus Audible because Libro supports independent bookstores, and Audible is an Amazon company. Right. And, and if um, you read on an e-reader, yes. you should get a Kobo, which yes. supports indie bookstores That's rather right. than a Kindle. Yes. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that concludes mm-hmm. commercials. Yes. But uh, <laughs> so, um, but um, but I was listening to it, and I was I mean just. To say I was enthralled is not even close. I was just, I was there. I mean, I was at that parade. I was, I was in the doctor's office. I was in Paris. I was in all of these places. And, um, and I, I carried it around with me. You know, I, I carried, I had the headphones around with me everywhere, driving everywhere, but always. And I was so, I, I got to chapter 45 of, I've told Rebecca this already, but I got to chapter 45 of 47. And they're in alternating chapters. Fiona has a chapter, Yale has a chapter. And I knew the la- I sensed that the last two chapters were going to be one, the last one from Yale and the last one from Fiona. And I just couldn't do it. Like, I just couldn't do it. Because I, ju- I wanted to live in a world in which Yale, in particular, was still alive, you know? And, and sorry. Like, no, no. I just, like, I just couldn't, well, like, and, like, <laughs> and, like, and so I, I have not, to this day, I actively did, have not finished the book, yeah. which I feel sort of guilty about, but I hope you know it's out of respect. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's all good. But, and I was saying, I was thinking of the end of that, uh, which I just remember today, the end of that Susan Sontag story, The Way We Live Now, and uh, that iconic story in the 80s. Uh, that came out in the 80s, I believe, uh, about the AIDS crisis, and yeah. what's told from 26 points of view, right, each person with a different name starting with different letter of the alphabet, and kind of try- mirroring in a way that, that circle of friends that you have in your book, uh, with all these gay men who are all constantly talking to each other and checking in with each other, and, um, and the last line of that story is something like, if I say he's still alive, he's still alive, and then someone else says, he's still alive, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's kind of the relationship yeah. I have with that book. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, anyway. yeah. Thank you. Yes, Thank of you. course, of course. Okay, here's what I want to ask you. Okay. <laughs> um, bringing, you know, like, lightening things up a little bit. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> we both started our books with parties, mm. which is the worst idea. It's so hard. <laughs> right. It's mm-hmm. not that it can't work, but it's mm-hmm. so hard. Yeah. Um, 
on, on the one hand, it's an opportunity to introduce right. your reader to a scene because every, everyone's coming in and out, et cetera. You're also juggling so much. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you know, your primary task as a writer in the first pages of any piece of writing is to orient the reader. Mm -hmm. And throwing them into a chaotic party scene is perhaps <laughs> not the wisest way to do that. <laughs> right. And we both took this on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to believe it works for, I know it works for yours. I'd like to believe it works for mine. <laughs> Definitely works for yours. Um, yeah. So, okay, what were we thinking? <laughs> and right. then do, was that like, or did you not struggle with that at all? Was it totally easy? Well, in a weird way for me, it, like I should probably, sh should, and I want, I'm making a bookmark for later for you to talk about healthy terror, um, but uh, <laughs> yes. because because this is a so thing I heard you talk so about, which is so important for for writing. Um, but I kind of actually did not have a healthy terror about this scene because um, because I knew so I knew that there was so in the summer of '53, Truman Capote did invite uh, uh, Tennessee Williams and Frank to his party in Portofino. And I know that that invitation was extended. I don't know whether Williams and Merlot actually went to the party. Um, I do know that in for there a couple weeks after they got that invitation that are missing from Williams's journal. Um, not like torn out. I wish it would be more dramatic if it was like, torn <laughs> out. But um, but there but he just just doesn't make any entries in those weeks after. And so the sort of premise of the book is that, or the the launching point for the book is that. Frank and Tennessee go to Truman's party. There they meet um, another male couple, another same, you know, uh, writer, two men who are in a relationship. One is a writer and one is not. And they meet this, this fictional actress uh, and her mother, or it's not an actress yet, but she, they meet a fictional mother and daughter. And so I, it almost wrote itself in the sense that I knew that I had to start the book with all these characters coming on stage at the same time. And I also, you know, because this sort of thing like pleases me. I also like to think about it as a play. And since I'm writing about Williams, that yeah. in a play, like every, you know, everyone comes on stage in the first act, or not every play, but in the kind of traditional play, everybody's sort of on stage in the first act, and we get to meet all the characters, and then things sort of play out from there. Mm. So I kind of thought I had no choice but to start yeah. with that. But I actually had the same question for you about that party scene, because I wondered, because I know the book didn't Start, or maybe I'm wrong, but you said the book didn't start with the men, the, right? Mm, but, the idea, my writing yeah. started with that scene, but my idea oh. of it started with um, this other, this sort of subplot about mm -hmm. this woman who had been an artist's model in World War One era Paris, mm -hmm. who's in the world. Yale is the development director for a small art gallery. He's got this um, elderly donor giving art pieces. She was a model. Mm. Yeah, no, the books, the, the, in my thinking, the right. book started with her, but the writing, by the time I, I need a, like a long marination phase mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when I write. Um, one of the things that happened was um, I had this idea originally that this was going to be this woman. I wanted her looking back from the end of her life. So this is what put it in the 80s right. okay. originally. Um, and then I was, you know, it's like, okay, she's going to be, you know, dealing with an art guy. This is an opportunity to be writing about the AIDS epidemic, mm -hmm. which is something I've been wanting to write about for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really gonna be her story. Mm -hmm. And my original idea was um, she was gonna be sitting at home and watching the news, and a painting would come up on the news um, of sort of dubious authenticity. Mm -hmm. People didn't know if it was from this famous artist or not. And she knows because it's a painting of her, hmm. and she's trying to contact people in the art world and tell them this. And I was I was really plotting it out mentally for a long time, thinking mm -hmm. about it. And I was about to take off for uh, an artist residency in Wyoming mm -hmm. at Ucross. Mm -hmm. And the day before I left, my husband asked me about what I was working on, and I told him this whole idea about this woman. And she sees this thing, and he goes, <laughs> "Um, honey, you know that's the plot of the movie Titanic." <laughs> 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 but they, they bring up that sketch, and she's like, that's me, and I shall tell you. Um, and you're like, yeah, it did really well. I know, right? right? It made millions of dollars, so like, leave me alone. No, I, I, no, I was like, oh my god. So I got to Wyoming, yeah. and all I could do yeah. was stare out the window, and oh there's, it's god. like this gorgeous like, place. They're like, I'm writing Titanic. No, they're like these elk yeah. going by. Right, I was right, like, right. what am I doing? Right, right. And um, I had to rethink a lot, yeah. um, mm -hmm. which was good. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was starting to see these really interesting parallels between mm. the World War I generation and the AIDS generation. Yes, yes. Um, you know, the, what 
we know as the lost generation mm -hmm. because of the aftermath, right. because you know World War One and the influenza of 1918 right. decimated, mm -hmm. decimated that generation largely of its young able-bodied men. Mm -hmm. And um, in a city like Paris, where people had, you know, it was the age of the art academy, where people had been coming from all over, finding chosen family, and then this happened, the parallels between that and the city like Chicago in the AIDS generation were becoming very, very striking to me. Mm -hmm. So I was starting to find the book. So by the yeah. time I sat down to write, yeah. I was deep into my research, right. and it was like, okay, I'm gonna start with this party scene. <laughs> but, that, but the idea of like, you know, being at the party and then him, like this obviously was a spoiler, it's the first chapter, no. but, but he comes down and everyone's gone. Yeah. Like that to me was, it was both like a great plot device in the sense like, where are they? But it also was, of course, the perfect, in a way, a perfect metaphor for the crisis itself. Right. Like everyone is gone. You know? Right. And I mean, so I don't know how, like, was that part of the it was, thinking or just did it or happen organically? You know, it like was, that? I had a, I had a nightmare. Yeah. I yeah. had, I was, I was working on this. I had a nightmare. It was me in the nightmare that I had somehow fallen asleep upstairs at a party. Mm. And I came down and I was trying to sneak out of the house and get all my stuff and leave, bef you know, without waking up this family. And mm. I, it was one of those ones that really stuck, you know, kind of all day. Mm -hmm. And um, started to realize, I can't remember if I, I don't think I'd even thought of the party at that point, but mm -hmm. I was like, I think this is, I think this is something. I think that right. that feeling of eerie aloneness yeah. is something that I want to use. Um, and it, it ultimately, you know, I think that it's, it's playing a trick on you in some ways because it seems like, my, part of my intention is, it might seem like it's gonna work as a neat allegory right. in terms of who survives, right. for right. one thing. Right. Right. Also in terms of um, maybe that party being a set piece and you don't need to worry about what actually happened there. Mm -hmm. And actually there's a lot of cause and effect mm -hmm. that I wove into there that a lot of stuff happens. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know what's weird about that scene is, um, so basically what happens is if you haven't read it, um, there's a kind of a memorial party um, for someone who died a few weeks back, long story, and Yale goes upstairs to rest because he's not feeling well when he comes back out. Everyone is gone and he has no idea where they went. And there's a logical explanation. But um, very often when I read um, in, to a crowd, I read the end of that first chapter, mm -hmm. sort of ending with him wandering around this empty house. Um, before the book was out, I read it at a writer's conference and this young, young you know, like 22 year old, young woman writer came up to me and she was so excited because she thought I was writing sci-fi. Oh, wow. And she thought they'd been like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like spirited the leftovers away. Or yeah, 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 yeah right. aliens. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, but let me ask. So I understand that you were trying to work on this or think, starting this years back, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. so there's like some false starts or just, was it, was it that you weren't so ready? Was it that mm -hmm. you weren't ready to tell this story mm -hmm. or was it that you just hadn't caught the right end of it yet? Both. I okay. Think, yeah, I think I I I first I wasn't a, I mean I knew who Tennessee Williams was obviously and I probably read Glass Menagerie or or seen Streetcar or something like that. Um, but it was the late '90s and I was in a used bookstore in Delaware where where I'm from and I was I'm super cool. So it was a Friday night and that's what I was doing. I was in a used bookstore. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely remember very vividly that I was like, I had nothing, I, would, I had no life. So I was in the used bookstore and just sort of like, or I had the best life, but yes. I think about it, right? And, um, and I saw the memoir by Dotson Rader um, called Tennessee Cry of the Heart. And there is like, I'm a sort of, generally a melodramatic person and um, and my friends were snickering but um, and um, and that just that title Tennessee cry of the heart and then this photo of Williams on the cover of that of that book sort of shirtless like kind of holding himself and looking into the distance huh. I was like that's the book for me like yeah. you know and so I started reading it just expecting to know to learn something about Williams and um, and I opened just again I remember it so vividly I opened right to the scene in which this guy named Frank, who I didn't know anything about, um, uh, was dying in a hospital, a cancer ward at Memorial Hospital in 1963, um, waiting for Williams to come and visit him um, one last time. And I learned from the, the memoir that he was this working class Italian guy who had been Williams' partner and that they had been estranged by the end and that According, you know, to the author, all that he wanted was to see, you know, for, was for Williams to visit him. And again, my melodramatic self um, just really immediately identified with that, with the pathos of that, the pain of that, and also, of course, with the fact that I was a working class Italian American guy from Delaware, just a couple hour, you know, a couple hours south of where Frank was, and I was like, how did this guy? Um, 
what was their relationship like? How did this guy end up, you know, being being Williams's partner? How, you know, what was what what was their li- what what was their life like together? Um, and so I immediately just want I knew I wanted to write about them somehow, but I actually didn't know then that you could put real people into an, into a novel. I yeah. thought I'd have to write a biography, and I wasn't a nonfiction writer, so um, so I had no interest in writing a, bio- writing, bi- writing a biography. So I kind of set it aside. And then I saw the film Gods and Monsters, um, which is one of my favorite films. And then I read the book, and I thought, wait, oh, you can put real people into a story <laughs> and, uh, and make it fiction. And so I tried a bunch of things, and I'll spare you all the iterations of this novel, um, of this story. Uh, but I tried various ways, but it was, an, it was two major things happened. One was I realized I had to tell the story from Frank's perspective, that it was actually not about Williams. It was about yeah. Frank, and it was about their relationship. Like to me, Frank is the main character. Yeah. Their relationship is the second most important character, and then there's another character as well who informs them all. <coughs> and um, and so once I kind of figured that out, because I realized that I had nothing. I have nothing to add to our understanding of Tennessee Williams as a character and as a uh, as a writer as a playwright. Um, but I felt like I had something to add to their the, our understanding of their relationship hmm. and our understanding of Frank. So yeah. I knew that I was. So I'm never in Williams's head in this book. Um, anyone who wants to read this to f- figure out more about Williams, I feel like Mm-mm. I'm not in his head. I'm, it's really about it's really about Frank. Yeah, um, I think it's so. also about the atmosphere yeah. that they're existing in. Right? Yes. There's there's so much just about that world yes. that that you can then extrapolate. You know, if you're into Tennessee Williams, right. you can kind of learn. Okay, this is the the planet he lived on right. and here's yeah right and I wanted to you know again like you did try to recreate their set mm-hmm. you know like who they hung out with who they were you know bitchy with and catty with and who they were friends with and who who attracted them mm-hmm. you know which is why I landed on this um, this aspiring actress because for a lot for the longest time the novel and I think you'll appreciate this for the longest time my, the novel was one of the iterations was Frank telling his side of his relationship with Tennessee, and then this other guy named Sandro telling his side of his relationship with the writer John Horn Burns. Uh, how many people have heard of John Horn Burns? Only right. from your Not, book. Right, only from the book, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as there was a time when he was the great American writer. Wow. I mean, like, when, his, when the gallery, this novel called The Gallery came out in the late 40s, early 50s, I forget exactly, he was hailed as the next great American writer, and then his next two novels flopped. And then and, he died very young. And then he died very young, 10 days after this party at Sherman Capote's yeah. place. And um, so I located them there, and I was going to tell Williams and Frank's story from Frank's perspective, Sandro and John Horn Burns' story from Sandro's perspective, and it was going to be like a compare-contrast. Like, <laughs> you know, like, so they're like this, and they're like that. And I realized kind of, Way too late. Like the term that paper compa- writes itself. Yeah, that yeah. compare <laughs> contrast is not a plot. Yeah. You know? So like so I'm like, wait, this is not a this is actually not a novel. This is just my own kind of like this is what I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. So that's when that's when I had the to. The eleventh grade English that teachers out. of the world though. Right? Would eat that right? Up. I know. And I which I was one of those. I was I taught that so it makes sense. That uh, yeah. You that, taught eleventh grade? Uh, I taught yeah, I did no way. Grade high school. Yeah. When? How long? Uh, at, just for a year. Okay. Actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, right after right after after um, college, I taught uh, high school English, public speaking, strangely enough, and, yeah. um, and, um, and a couple other things. No way. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. so this is maybe, okay, yeah. maybe this is a weird, like, like I, we're going to get back to the books, but mm-hmm. we should like, talk about teaching because there mm-hmm. is this weird thing of, like, yeah. we have these parallel jobs yes. in different cities. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and I think we, we both ultimately, I mean, I think there are many writers teach because they have to. Mm-hmm either to earn a living or just, you know, as a writer, you get brought into some university, you're supposed to give a lecture. Right. Um, but I think we genuinely both really love teaching or we wouldn't be in these positions. Mm-hmm. Like you taught a high school, I taught elementary school for 12 right, years. Right, right, right. Um, before my first novel, or until that. after my first novel came yeah. out. Um, and like, okay, <laughs> does it mess you up? <laughs> your writing, does it mess your writing up? Not you as a person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, well, the advice I usually give to like aspiring writers is to, to, I mean, this is going to sound weird given that the fact that I actually do love teaching, but is actually to teach as little as possible or to teach, to teach, to teach in a way that is contained, right? Mm. To, 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 um, to, because 
Um, I love I love working with aspiring writers. I love helping them. I love all of that. But I feel like we each get like a like a limited number of words that we can deal with every day. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> and um, yeah. and if I spend all of my time working with other students on their words. I feel like I get I I don't leave enough for myself because also right. like you I just throw myself into their yeah. projects like they become my projects like I have to I have to help them make make them as good as they can possibly be yeah and I just don't have enough left over for myself uh, but it's so satisfying that I I like to do it but it has to be contained yeah you know and um, yeah. so I've like you have found a way of both being in the writing world and teaching some and doing other stuff that's more administrative yeah um, that's the thing yeah but um, but but. But but I but I always come back to teaching because I do feel this is such a cliche cliche alert that like I do feel like I learn yeah. so much from both their mistakes and also the pos the, the 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 things they do narratively with plot with character oh, yeah. with structure with all those things I learn from them and yeah. so it becomes really I can't think of really I can't think of ever giving it up. You no, know, no, I can't so, imagine. Yeah. Do you well, because for me, yeah, and uh, like my thing, you know, same administrative role, and then mm -hmm. I teach this year long novel course. Mm -hmm. um, and it's for people starting novels. So right. I only read about 100 pages of their work, which is, again, you know, limited, contained, good right. thing. Right, right. Um, but I've been doing it for um, nine years now. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of every class, we basically have group therapy. Like, we go around, like, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. What's happened since last month? Mm -hmm. What have you ever written? Mm -hmm. And, they, you know, the things they're struggling with come up. And it's really cool for them to hear that someone else is struggling with the same things. But right. for me, it's like nine years in a row of, like, yeah. oh, like 12, year, 12 students each time, 12 yeah. times nine, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're all, like, they all go through these cycles of getting allergic to their own work mm -hmm. and these crises of faith and then mm -hmm. coming back to it. Um, you know, there's a point midway where you're like, wait, who's telling, wh what, what are words? What even are like, <laughs> right. who's telling this right. story? Did right. someone write? like, you know, there's this kind of uh, hyper self-awareness that happens midway. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But it can be, I mean, it, you, I, I, I do, I do worry about getting like too much, you know, too involved in it because it does yeah. kind of. I don't know, but it, but it does also open all these possibilities. So, yeah. But. Well, there are times at the end of the day, it's like I, you know, I would love. I've been, you know, reading student work all day. I've been writing if I can. I've been right. dealing with emails, and right. I fall into bed, and it's like there's a great novel on my bedside table, and it's like mm -hmm. I should really read that. Right. Again, limited uh, words. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. So what I do instead is the like, New York Times crossword puzzle, which yes. is also words, <laughs> right, but it's right. not. It's different. different. Yeah. Very yeah, different. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> can you talk? About, I know it's a total like non. Non, oh, non segue. Let's go. But yeah. I just love what you said because I know a lot of people probably are gonna are gonna are wondering about you know the whole question of like you know why are you telling the yeah. story and how do you get to tell the story and the whole idea of this he of, of healthy terror that which is what I think is what made this book work so well. Thank you. Is that you and I love the story about when you didn't have the healthy terror uh, with the oh with the, the library. Yeah, the library. Yes. yeah. So if you don't mind, I'll tell that. I, yeah. yeah. Chris has heard me talk quest. like at a, at yeah, a right. great extent yeah. about this. <laughs> yeah. um, but then like I want to turn this eventually yeah. I want to turn this back on you and talk sure. about you know writing real people right. which is something I'm really scared of yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah so I you know this I could talk all day and if <laughs> you know if people have questions at the end we can talk right. more whatever if you really want to about <laughs> You know, this, this question of appropriation, about ownership, mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm writing across demographic difference in many ways, um, not the least of which is generational. Mm -hmm. um, and that, for me, actually presented more challenges than anything else. Yep. When I was making mistakes, they were almost always generational mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so before, I'll give examples, but then first I'll say what, I, what Chris has heard me say before mm -hmm. is that my very first novel... Um, it's, it's called The Borrower. It's about a children's librarian who inadvertently kidnaps a 10-year-old boy and drives him across country. Um, and um, similar themes in a, in a very slight sense in that this is a kid who had been put into anti-gay therapy by his parents, evangelical Christian parents, lots of other stuff going on at home too, and he kind of runs away and blackmails her into kidnapping him. But um, I was, it was my first book I was kind of just terrified to be writing a book. I wouldn't even call it a book. I would tell people I was working on this longer thing. <laughs> and um, I, um, I did a lot of online research, but it, I, it would have never dared to approach actual humans and ask them about their experience <laughs> because that would have 
involved me saying I'm a writer, mm -hmm. which was not something that I could say with a straight face at that point. Mm -hmm. And I researched librarian life online, mm -hmm. the technical stuff within an inch of its life. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was, I had this, you know, I, I was technically accurate mm -hmm. that this woman could have gotten a job, not as a librarian, but as a library worker, technically mm -hmm. um, kind of temporary head of a children's department um, at an underfunded library in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. There, there's nothing implausible about that. Right. Um, she doesn't have training. She just kind of fell into, you know, this happened. And when the book came out, um, of course, it was my first novel, so I'm, you know, Googling every review, which is super healthy. Um, and, um, sure, um, I've only done that with my first novel. Right, oh, yeah, totally. yeah, yeah, no, totally. Um, no, I, I totally agree with that. I don't, yeah. um, but um, these online reviews, for, like things from librarians, they were incensed, not that she had kidnapped a 10-year-old child, but that she didn't have a Master of Library Science. <laughs> <laughs> um, which if I had talked to a librarian, right. I would have known, right? right? right. It's like, wait, okay, listen, I called her a library worker. I didn't right. call her a librarian. Right. I was very careful yeah. about this. But no, like because I was inadvertently reinforcing what they see to be a negative stereotype of mm -hmm. this being kind of unskilled labor, which was mm -hmm. never, never my intention. Right. But... I had not done all the legwork, right. right? That I should have done. Right. Um, and um, you didn't think you had to, right? Because no. Well, you're like, I'm in a school. I, well, I see librarians thing. all the time. Right. This is right? the thing. I yeah. did not feel like I was right. writing across difference. Right. I was. Exactly. I was teaching fifth grade. Right. I was writing about a children's, you know, right. ch a <laughs> library worker in a children's right. library, yeah. a, like white woman of around my age. She's, you know, like. I, it was like as close, like it was basically as close as I could get to putting right. me in a book without, right. you know, I was like, oh, I'll change her just slightly to have her this slightly other job. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it didn't, it didn't tank that book or anything. Actually, most librarians were very supportive of the book. It's been fine. But um, it, um, you know, the, I came a long way since then, partly because of that, partly just because I grew as a person, as an right. author, um, you know, in three books later, I'm on this book. And, um, also, the fact that I, you know, was terrified to realize what I was writing. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just trying to write this lovely book about this artist <laughs> model, and then suddenly I'm writing about the AIDS epidemic. Um, I'm writing across difference. I'm in in so many different ways, and about one of the most sensitive things I could possibly be writing about. Um, and so, um, this is the very long story, very short. Um, most of my research was interview based, was archival based, in part because I knew it was important, and in part because I went to the library thinking I could find a few books about the AIDS epidemic in America's third largest city, and there are zero. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, so I was kind of forced out from behind my desk mm -hmm. sooner than I thought I would be. Um, but I sat down with you know doctors, nurses, lawyers, activists, journalists, historians, survivors, just absolutely everyone I could, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, you know the whole. I, I won't. I, I won't dig into the question of appropriation unless people really right. want to talk about that. But I'll say that in terms of my research, really, it was kind of wild. The generational stuff was the hardest That's thing. Amazing. The two, yeah, the examples that I always sense. give. One is that um, my husband, who's eight years older than me, caught this where I had someone putting something in a cup holder in the car. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, no. <laughs> I was like, oh. Yeah. I mean, I was I was alive. I was a kid, you right. know. But I was like, yeah, okay. And then. Um, <laughs> If you ever want to get told again and again how young you are, <laughs> just write something that was set when you were a child. <laughs> and people will constantly tell you, like, mm -hmm. I was alive. I wasn't mm -hmm. like, you know, I wasn't, I was not unborn. I right. just, you know. Right. But anyway, um, then um, the, the more important one to me is just a, as an example, um, I have in chapter three, what's not chapter three, um, Yale, after that party where he can't find his friends, he's walking down the street. He's walking down a North Halstead in Chicago, which is and was where all the gay bars are. And he's looking for his friends. And I had him looking in the windows of these bars for his friends. <laughs> um, many audiences that I say that to are like, what? What? <laughs> okay, yeah, you can't look in the window of a gay bar in 1985. Okay. Um, right, right. So I, you know, that was something I caught long before it got to manuscript stage. This was, I was across from my friend Owen in a Dunkin' Donuts, mm -hmm. and he was telling me stuff about the bar scene. And I was like, and he, you know, he just mentions in passing windows painted black, and I was like, 
<laughs> jot that down without uh, right, like I'm trying right. not to change my facial right. expression so he doesn't know I didn't right. know that. And it sounds but, like such a small thing, but of course if oh you're God. that if you're that reader reading that and you right. see the and you see him looking in the way, you're oh like, I'm out. Like no, right. this has no credibility. No, and this no chapter three. No, right. No, right. it doesn't. It doesn't. Exactly. Right. right. And so it was right. I mean, it was many stages of people right. reading the manuscript, right. all those things. But the main point was right. I could not have gone into this with any sense of hubris. Right. right? There's just no way that I can go in. You know, our job as fiction writers is always that leap of empathy, mm -hmm. right? Empathetic imagination. But it's not enough right. um, that you, you have to do the legwork. You have to be humble in the face of all this. Mm -hmm. When you're writing about either real people, mm -hmm. in your case, and this mm -hmm. is what I want to hear about from mm -hmm. you, or in my case, um, Harold Washington is actually the only real human in my book. <laughs> um, but in my case, you know, people who had real life corollaries, right. people whose, you know, um, counterparts absolutely existed and many of whom, not enough, are still with us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just had to go in assuming that the littlest thing is not to be taken for granted. It's mm -hmm. not something you know anything about. Right. So I right. want to hear from you yeah. though <laughs> about writing about real people because this is yeah. something I've been terrified of. Right. My second novel, which mm -hmm. is historical, I had all these. I had Georgia O'Keeffe in it right, originally, right. and all these artists because yeah. it's about an artist colony, and then I took them all out because <laughs> I couldn't do it. Like I was, too, I felt way too limited. Right. Working with real people, not that it, sh it was not like no one should do this. It was like I right. personally can't do this. So right. I want to know how you did right. that. Yeah, and interestingly, again, like I, I didn't like the party scene. I didn't worry about it one bit. Like I, I really, I really thought, um, uh, well, once I knew I could do it, once I knew I was allowed to do it, that I was allowed to put a real person in a novel, I, I never questioned it. You know, and I've had people ask me, like, even as, even almost as a moral question, like, like, do you, you know, like, same thing, like, do you have the right to tell that story? Do I have the right to, to tell? Frank, Mer Frank, Frank Merlin, it never once bothered me. I never questioned it mm -hmm. um, um, because um, it's, it's just, it's, it, I went into it as an artistic inquiry. You know, yeah. I went into it as, with respect and with empathy to try to figure out what this relationship was like and looking for um, parallels, not one-to-one not -one parallels in modern life or anything like that, but just, just deeply investigating what it means for two people to be together, right? And, um, and they just hap in this case, he just happened to be, this just happened to be Frank in Tennessee, right? And, um, but so the dirty little secret of this is that it's so much easier, like don't tell anybody, okay. but it's like so much easier to it's write about real people. It's a good thing we're not on the radio. Right, yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just us. Um, it's so much easier to write about, not that this book was easy, but it's, but I had I had questions from already answered from the beginning. Like, what did they look like? Um, when did they die? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, how did they die? What did they do for a living? Like, all of the um, all of the kind of surface exterior stuff about the character was already done for me. So I didn't have that angst about where should I make him a potter? Should I make him, <laughs> you know, whatever? Like I knew what yeah. he what he was. I feel that's was. like that's like what I'm going through right yeah. now. I've changed yeah. the profession of right. like my, my book that I'm working on now. Yeah. I've changed this woman's profession seventeen times. Right, yeah. right. Make it George O'Keefe, you know what she did. Yeah. So, Shoot. Yeah, so, um, it's said in nineteen ninety five, is that a problem? That's not a problem at all. <laughs> there is a book like isn't there a book like Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter? Right. Something? You can okay. do whatever you want. Yeah. You know? So, whatever you want. We're good. Okay. Uh, so, um, <laughs> That's amazing. so I felt like I felt like I had these characters, and so the job of I feel like I actually find the genre of writing about real people or making real people fictional characters incredibly exciting because I feel like it's a, I mean, and of course there's books that do it really well and books that are that don't do it as well, like any genre, but um, but I feel like it's incredibly exciting because um, it, it seems so perfectly suited to the fiction writer because. Um, what you know, what do fiction writers do best? I think we get we we so the world knows like the the history books know who Frank Merlot was, who Tennessee Williams was, their biographies, all that stuff is done, right? But what the fiction writer can do is inhabit the character, give us his interiority, give us his interior right. life, right. Um, make him uh, like like show his heart beating, like, you know, you, you know, like just, yeah. and, 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 and when that biographers way we get to know him try better. to do that, right. and it do ticks it. me off. <laughs> They're like, he smelled right. the air. Right, right, right. Like, I you agree. don't know that. I totally agree. But fiction yeah. can do it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. totally agree. Like, even though, like, 
the best biographies read like novels in the sense. I don't. I also agree when I don't like it when it gets too close. I'm like, no, that's my territory. You know? Oh yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. But um, but yeah. So I really felt like I um, I felt like if I if I did if I had a healthy terror, I keep using that phrase because I love it so much. Yeah. I had a healthy terror about the fact that like I had to really work hard to get it right because the, this, these were real people. So so I had to I had to do my research. I had to talk to all the people who I could talk to or it made sense to talk to. Um, I, my, my, one of my favorite conversations was with a guy who, uh, in, in Chicago actually, named Tony Narducci, um, who, was, who calls himself the last living lover of Tennessee Williams, um, who met him in the early 80s um, in Key West. And he was a sort of you know, like short, wrestler's body, Italian guy. Like, Williams had a type, type right? And so, I mean, it wasn't his only type, but that was one of his types. And, um, and they met at a bar in Key West. And um, and I spent you know hours and hours and hours with him telling wow. me about you know what it was and I heard heard some pretty juicy details and all sorts all sorts of things and and doing that kind of research helping to kind of fill in all of that and then my job was to pick the details that I needed the exterior details but it really was to 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 figure out who was Frank as a character like what what did he want that whole writer. Thing. And um, and and how can I bring him to life in a way that would be satisfying for a reader, you yeah. know? And I feel like that. And so all that, the long, the I'm repeating myself, but but all the stuff that I, that I, I was able to focus on that so much more because all the other questions were already answered. Yeah, the exterior awesome. questions were already answered. Are we done? Should we end on that? Should we end on that? Okay. Okay. Yeah, <laughs>